Well, welcome everyone to this Jeju Forum 2020 panel on existential threats and global and regional governance. Organised for the forum by the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, APLN. I'm Gareth Evans, I'm chair of the APLN. In earlier incarnations, I was uh, Foreign Minister of Australia, I was president of the Brussels-based International Crisis Group, and more recently, Chancellor of the Australian National University. It's my very great pleasure as moderator to be accompanied on this panel by four colleagues of extraordinary experience and accomplishment. They are in the order in which they'll be making their opening remarks. Des Brown, or the Right Honourable Lord Brown of Ladyton, as we're now obliged to call him since his elevation to the House of Lords, uh, joining us from the UK. Former UK Secretary of Defence, co-founder of APLN's sister organisation, the European Leadership Network, ELN, and since 2014, Vice Chair of the Washington-based Nuclear Threat Initiative. Then secondly, we've got Dong Ing Xing, uh, joining us from Seoul, a very distinguished career diplomat who's focused throughout his career primarily on multilateral and global affairs, including as ambassador and permanent representative to the international organisations in Vienna, deputy permanent representative also to the UN in New York. Since leaving uh, government, Dong Ik has been teaching at Yonsei University in the Korean National Diplomatic Academy and acting as a senior policy advisor at the Korea Institute of Nonproliferation and Control. Then Meli, Meli Caballero Anthony, joining us from Singapore, Professor of International Relations, Head of the Centre for Non-Traditional Studies, Security Studies at the Raja Ratnam School at Nanyang Technological University. Uh, she's led a number of global and regional projects on security and governments and has served as Director of External Relations at the ASEAN Secretariat and also Chair of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament. And last but uh, never least, Kevin Rudd, joining, like me, from Australia. Kevin was, of course, Australia's Prime Minister and for a time Foreign Minister from 2007 to 2013, where among many other achievements, he played an absolutely central part in energising the G20 to respond effectively to the global financial crisis of 2008-09. Since leaving domestic politics, he's been prominent and influential in many international roles, including as president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York and chair of the Independent Commission on Multilateralism. So we couldn't have a better qualified or more thoughtful group of speakers to tackle this Jeju Sessions topic, meeting the existential threats, of the pandemic, nuclear war and climate change. Is present global and regional governance fit for purpose? Well, this, hard, this topic could hardly be a more timely one. I think we're all acutely conscious that at a time when the world faces multiple serious threats, with the most serious of all of them being those that threaten the very existence of life on this planet as we know it, pandemics like COVID, out of control global warming, a prospect of a nuclear holocaust. At this time, our international institutions have never looked more feeble or fragile. The central question we have to confront is whether in this age of increasingly assertive, go it alone nationalism, we can recover the kind of commitment to multilateral cooperation we must have if we are to protect and advance a whole range of global and regional public goods, and above all, to meet the challenges of those big three existential threats, which are described in this session's title. So our task in this panel, in the initial presentations of eight minutes or so each, and then in the interactive half hour of discussion, which will follow, our task will be to analyze, will be to analyze the extent of the global, regional, and indeed national governance problems we now have, and to identify ways of lifting our game. I should perhaps note that because this session is being recorded in October, before the results of the US presidential election is known, we are all flying rather, flying rather blind on what may be the most consequential event of them all for the future of global governance. But I'm sure that constraint won't inhibit any of our distinguished panelists from stimulating and engaging us as we wrestle with these very tough questions. So I yield the floor or the screen to our first presenter, Des Brown. Over to you, Des. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Gareth. Thanks for those words of introduction, for the personal words of introduction for me uh, too. And thanks to the Jeju Forum for this invitation. It's an honour to be on this uh, very distinguished panel. 
to discuss this enormous topic. Um, so I'll restrict myself to eight minutes, but it makes it difficult to do anything more than just set the scene for our discussion. But we do have uh, we do have that discussion. So let me start just with a short anecdote, a reflection on something I read recently. Before the first presidential debate, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists published an existential risk scorecard with the following introduction, which I read short, but you can read it for yourself. Yeah. We hope the presidential debate moderators ask the following questions. This year, record-breaking wildfires, storms and rising temperatures have buttressed scientists' warnings that the climate is changing due to human activity and time is running out. The question, what role should the United States play? With new start about to expire, a half century of nuclear arms control efforts is nearing its end. What will you do to prevent a new nuclear arms race? And finally, what will you do to turn back the hands of the doomsday clock? In a sense, the expectation that existential risks would not be touched on otherwise, unless these questions were asked. And in the first debate, this proved to be justified, perhaps answers the basic question of just how fit governance is for meeting existential risks when it cannot penetrate that, uh, that, that, that competition. Well, humanity faces three such risks at the same time, nuclear war, climate change and pandemic. World governments appears to be many to be in gridlock and leaders appear disengaged from the bigger picture, uh, dealing as it happens at the moment with the narrow national impact of the pandemic and often blaming others for that problem nationally. Over the past years, nationalism appears to be on the rise globally. Rising nationalism is seen everywhere and in everything, from the election of Donald Trump to Brexit in my own country, the national policies of the Japanese former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, his Indian counterpart Narendra Modi and the Turkish President Erdogan, to the success of far-right parties in Italy, Germany and in Austrian elections too. News coverage of nationalism has been global, focusing on US elections and the British referendum, but also government policies in the Philippines, China and India, as well as in South Africa not to mention social media, and that could occupy us for the rest of our time today. Books for institutions put in place to create a world order for peace and prosperity established circumstances under which globalisation could thrive. Encouraging interdependence to deepen as new countries joined the global economy, people travelled more, companies expanded internationally, and once distant peoples and places found themselves increasingly intertwined, apparently to their benefit, but expanding global governments also set in motion trends that eventually undermine their own effectiveness. Core multilateral institutions which we created about 70 years ago, for example, the Security Council have just proven resistant to adapting to change. Established interests cling to outmoded decision-making rules that fail to reflect current conditions. Problems we are facing on a global scale are more complex, but they also penetrate deep into domestic policies, like arms control, climate change, pandemics, or, the, or even the cross-border control of personal data affects all of our daily lives. And often these are difficult to resolve. Multipolarity interacts with complexity, making negotiations tougher and making them harder. To prevent runaway environmental destruction or terrain in nuclear proliferation or dampen pandemic infections demands cooperation. It appears that our tools for global policy making are breaking down or are proving to be inadequate. State-to-date negotiations over treaties and international institutions are practically moribund at a time when we need them most. So why is this happening? Well, first, reaching agreement in international negotiations is made much more complicated by the rise of new powers like India, China and Brazil. A more diverse array of interests must be hammered into agreement for any global deal to be made. My fear is that COP26, which is scheduled for 2021 in my city, Glasgow, will confirm rather than challenge that stultifying complication. On the one hand, multipolarity is a positive sign of development, and the other, it brings more voices and interests to the table, and these are hard to weave into coherent outcomes. Threats are exacerbated because world leaders have allowed the international political structure for managing to erode through neglect, and there's going distrust among leaders themselves. COVID-19, which I'm sure we will hear from others in more detail about, has demonstrated how fair we are adequately to, cons to consider the importance of governance globally and nationally has undermined pandemic preparedness. The success of any efforts to redress this failure, including reform of existing governance arrangements, will be contingent on an effective multilateral order that is committed to providing both sufficient financial and political support to global institutions. 
George Perkovic, whom I admire greatly, writing for the Canadian Endowment for International Peace, explained in a few pithy words why arms control is failing, or may indeed have failed. Like hard breaks, he says, nuclear arms control is easy to take for granted until it fails. And today it is failing badly with the nuclear arms race back on. The world has no reliable brakes to reduce the damage of a catastrophic collision. We've watched the arms control system that served well during the Cold War collapse in just under two decades. Has Russia violated and the United States abandoned the series of agreements? Most recently, US President Donald Trump's administration has threatened to let lapse in early 2021 the last treaty governing strategic nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, the US broke the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, and the situation in North Korea remains boribund. India and Pakistan, the two nuclear opponents who have most recently come closest to colliding, have not even attempted to negotiate limits on their growing arsenals. Finally, the climate change risk echoes the same call to arms for strong global governments. As a Chatham House report pointed out 11 years ago, the risks associated with climate change call on us to put in place global governments that it's flexible, adaptive, and diverse. And we're a long way from that. So the key point I wish to make in these remarks is the plea for better leadership. It's imperative that both our leaders of today see, the, see past the short-term nature of the political cycle and that we encourage future generations to take advantage of modern communication to build global alliances to advance a more responsible agenda for governments. It's time to encourage world leaders to act before matters spin even further out of control and to take concrete steps to reverse this negative momentum and all three existential dangers. Society's recent evolution, dramatic demographic change, huge technological process and human and environmental interconnectedness have created an inescapably interdependent world in which states cannot by themselves manage the challenges to their future prosperity and security even when they're living in peace. The future of international order cannot lie simply in reforming today's institutions, as important as that is. The world needs a new concept of global cooperation better suited to these changes and to the way in which people live their lives. One which relies on contributions of citizens, civil society, the private sector, and political actors below the level of the state. The more distributed approach to international relations, a more distributed approach to international relations, will put a premium on building bridges and dialogue. And that's why I've devoted the last decade of my life to encouraging dialogue of this nature in the Euro-Atlantic security sphere. I can't speak a, a, with any great authority about a, multilateral global governance, but I know a lot about the part of the world I live in. And when it comes to the conversation, I'm happy to talk about that. Well, thank you very much indeed, Des. That was an admirable description of the nature of the issues, the problems we're facing, and a, a broad brush approach to the solutions through improving the quality of dialogue and commitment. So the prescriptions are something we'll explore in a bit more detail when we come to the, the discussion. But we turn now to uh, Dongik Xing uh, from Seoul for his presentation. Over to you, Dongik. I'd like to share so my uh, short uh, slides to help you understand. Okay, so my topic, now the hour of uh, so many global challenge issue, second phase, is uh, many global challenges we see, but so uh, today's topic is three challenges, non preparation, nuclear armament, and climate change, and pandemic. I like to focus specifically the pandemic issue, COVID-19. I'd like to just to mention again about why the global response, global governance system failed. So competition between US and China, no leadership, G0, uh, and collapse of dual structure. Unlike the previous case, Ebola, there's a developing countries was uh, the target to help from the developed world, G7 advanced economies, but it's the case, the most advanced countries, France, Germany, UK, was hit hard, hardly. And so there's no, uh, the provider uh, of the assistance and the, there's no, uh, it's a go along nationalism and protectionism. 
take care of their own uh, country. Shut down border, social distancing, so many problems, economic and social. And Dr. Kissinger warned of a world city, protectionist and nationalistic trend. And WHO's their initial response was not efficient and in a sense incoherent in declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic and through the PHEIC. And more importantly, US leadership under President Trump was uh, quite mixed and hostile to global governance system WHO. And finally, they withdrew and froze the fund. It's financial problems, so there's no efficient and massive assistance to the country's concern. Next. So what are they doing now to reestablish and rebuild the global governance? Now the WHO in the last May general conference European Union started initiating the mobilized significant resource to protect from COVID-19. And global leaders also commitment, they commit to accelerate production vaccine. Vaccine is only the, the last resort to cure the many patients and assure equitable success worldwide. And United Nations last month, September General uh, Assembly, 75th, 5th Assembly, Secretary General Guterres, in the same line with WHO, he stressed the importance of multilateralism, building trust. So vaccine must be available and affordable to all. He warned, either we come together in global institution to the fit for purpose, or we'll be crushed by divisiveness and chaos. Even former UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon here in Seoul, he stressed the same principle. When he, he comes to rebuild this global governance system, we must build better with a different set of priorities. He enjoyed to uh, quote the word Pope Francis. He reminds nature never give forgives. So next, South Korea, what are you going to do? So it's a kind of middle power country. So our contribution, our the view, perspective on the multilateral cooperation uh, to strengthen global governance system. We are very firm and very strong advocate on multilateralism. You know why? The Korea was born and became an independent country in 1945 when the United Nations was inaugurated and established. And then Korean War during uh, 1950-53, UN sent the coalition forced to repel North Korean invasion. And finally, we joined the United Nations in 1991 when the Cold War was over. And followed by UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon, Korean nationality was based in UN Secretary General 2007 and 16. This is the kind of unique history between United Nations and South Korea. So now it's time to make some contributions and uh, we will be facing a uh, global challenge, COVID-19. First, the urgency of multilateral action. First, overcome pandemic and prepare for the next one. We don't know what will be the next serious, the pandemic or challenge. And vaccine is global, should be global good. That will be a crucial test for the global solidarity to reinvigorate multilateralism. International, the journal, the press, comment Korea's case can be successful model. They analyzed key to success of South Korea, uh, blending technology and testing, centralized control and communication. So we had a bitter lessons in 2015 from the MERS case. So we, uh, that is based on that, uh, the lessons. So our solution you know, were straightforward, but quite flexible without full shutdown of economy. So what we are going to share our lesson and best practice is a based of preparedness and response framework, detection, containment, treatment, 3T, test, track, treat. treat. So plus well-functioning national insurance system, medical human resources infrastructure, 
So this photo is quite uh, interesting, but it's a symbol of the South Korea's response system. So one female nurse smiling when it, in the forefront battling with COVID-19. So what are you going to do to contrib make a contribution for global and regional context? The firstly, global context. So we support the Access COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, A, WHO, and other global initiatives now working hard to collect their resources to make uh, some final exit. And second, so South Korea initiated the Group of Friends of Solidarity for Global Health Security. Foreign Minister Kang byung hosted hosted the first meeting in COVID-19 during the 75th General Assembly last month, September 23rd. And Korean, a world widely known Korean boy group BTS delivered the message of solidarity, particularly the hope for the future generation who are facing many difficulties even in education due to the COVID-19. So now also this familiar uh, group of alliance of multilateralism. So to Kevin Roth, uh, he's a chair person of Commission of Multilateralism. So we have many things in common work together. And my foreign minister can participate that ministry meeting to discuss to, to set up the multilateral health architecture. The regional base, so Korean uh, President Moon specifically proposed Northeast Asia Cooperation Initiative for Infectious Disease Control and Public Health. And during uh, his UNGA General Statement, is very specific to Korea, China, Japan, Mongolia, sub-regional mechanism to address the infectious and pandemic issue. Regional level, ASEAN Korea, ASEAN Press 3, East Asia Summit, ASEAN Regional Forum is a relevant mechanism. But I, my personal view is inter-regional cooperation mechanism, G20, APEC, ASEAN FELA is more relevant. The G20 is familiar theme, topic to Australian colleague, uh, Kevin and Gares. So we can more elaborate. MICTA, five countries, Australia and Korea, Indonesia, Turkey, is another mechanism. So to complement the, the, some of uh, the default and some problems of the governance system, Korea EU summit and bilateral basis is always we have the number one agenda is the pandemic COVID-19. South Korea is a very unique position in the middle between developed and developed countries. So we are going to try to increase the volume of ODA despite economic recession. And this time we are focusing on medical and health area with sharing Korea's experience. We can play a kind of bridging role with our advanced technology, ICT and medical uh, treatment response uh, knowledge. So in conclusion, all in all, so Korea can be play a somewhat constructive middle powers role. And we have teaching from the very old uh, period, action is more important than the words. So global challenge demands global response. To do that, we need to strengthen the global cooperation based on multilateralism, and we need to rebuild rather than the change or the, the add more international global system. So we need to rebuild and reform global and regional governance. I'd like to quote the Bill Gates, very interesting and good uh, words, expression. So we, we are now seeing that COVID-19 is a great disaster, but he thinks it can be great corrector, correcting something the human society made a mistake. So it can be a quick opportunity to change our life and international order into the right direction. So this is the message and uh, we have to, to improve the, the global governance system, regional governance system. So the like my countries, France countries and coalition force can make us some certain role in complementing existing governance and regional cooperation mechanism. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dongik, Professor Shin, for that very important contribution. The middle powers really do 
have a potentially quite major role in stepping up to fill those gaps and provide some of the, the leadership that is needed for effective response. So that's a theme we do want to pick up again in the discussion later on. Thank you so much for raising it in the way that you did. We now turn to our other professor, Professor Meli Caballero Anthony, who joins us from Singapore and will give us, among other things, I guess, a Southeast Asian regional perspective on the quality of governance there and how to respond to it. So over to you, Meli. Thanks very much, uh, Gareth, and thank you to April N for um, inviting me. I'm delighted uh, to join this uh, panel and to uh, also join this conversation on uh, whether our global and regional uh, governance uh, is fit for purpose. Uh, to start with, um, I would offer a more nuanced uh, response to whether this uh, our institutions, uh, our global institutions are fit for purpose uh, for the very reason that um, as the previous speakers have already uh, mentioned, the kinds of challenges that we now face, uh, they call it 21st uh, century challenges, particularly climate change, are, are really very different. They are more complex, they are more cross-cutting, talk about uh, climate change and its impact on food and water and other and health security, talk about pandemics and its impact on economic security. So, and they're also transnational in scope. I mean, looking at pandemics, I don't think there's any country that's really immune to it. Hence, global multilateral institutions like the UN are, are rendered almost uh, inadequate in responses. They're fully stretched, and especially because they are poorly resourced. Think about the budgetary uh, problems confronting the UN and the WHO. But I, I, another issue I think which needs to be recognized is the, the lack or absence of mandate. I recall in 2000 when peacekeeping operations was suddenly faced with a, a more complex operation ranging not just from keeping the peace, but even in building and rebuilding the peace. And think about the WHO now uh, in its attempt to uh, command, compel countries to uh, for, for mandatory reporting as far as outbreaks of infectious diseases are concerned. And so that mandate and in climate change, uh, for the longest time of the last two years, the UNSC has been discussing about the need to have a unit, a designated unit in the, uh, in the UN to deal with climate change. And the UNSC is hampered by contentions that this is not something that a body in charge of international and peace and security should be dealing with, that should be dealt with by UNDP or UNEP. And of course, there are other issues, really the absence of global leadership that, was, can, that cannot be um, um, understated, uh, especially when you have the United States reneging on multilateral agreements like the uh, Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement, the uh, uh, nuclear agreement, uh, Iran nuclear agreement, withdrawal from the W, etc. So many of these problems, including, of course, the, st the strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China, not just limited to trade wars, but also with technological competition. The same problems and its impact uh, affect regional governance. But I have three points uh, in, in, in regard to addressing these issues. First is that um, global governance uh, through a rules-based multilateral system with the UN at its core, it's still the best hope to address the kind of global security challenges that we face in the 21st century. Despite limitations, UN and other multilateral institutions, they set global norms, norms which are critical for global governance. They set standards and practices for dealing with issues that affect international peace and security. One could in fact argue that without the UN and its related agencies and other multilateral institutions, we would need to invent one to address the kinds of problems we face today. Multilateral institutions provide criti the critical platforms to pull ideas and to work together to deal with shared common challenges facing humanity, and thus also deepen uh, and foster international cooperation to advance shared interest. And here, particularly in Asia and Southeast Asia, which have smaller countries, multilateral global institutions, allows them to have a voice um, in, in the global discourses and matters of international security. The second point is, but given the slow progress, the lack of momentum and serious challenges faced by global institutions, then regional governance become more important building blocks for global governance. 
seen from the perspective of subsidiarity, you know, one can be done uh, best at the lowest level because they are uh, the most affected and it also allows for better accountability along the way. So regional governance through regional institutions and processes allows for what we call a decentralized form of governance away from the, the, the more centralized you know, global governance system. This decentralized governance allows for countries sans global leadership uh, through the red, to, to have that kind of agency. And in fact, that uh, regional institutions have already displayed the agency to lead and to work collectively on shared problems. Uh, in, in East Asia, uh, we have uh, ASEAN and the other ASEAN-led institutions like the ASEAN Plus 3 and the EES, particularly with ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3 in dealing with, uh, with pandemic we see, and I, and I suppose we can come back to that with more detail, we see a, a, a significant uh, areas of cooperation in information exchange, in ensuring that there is uh, uh, lessons learned in dealing with the pandemics, even down to um, beefing up uh, uh, regional supply through a stockpile, stockpile of medicines and therapeutics. And with the idea, of course, of also including vaccines so that the rest of the poorer countries in the region can have equal or equitable access to this vaccine. So having a resident stockpile. And, um, and uh, the most uh, ambitious at the moment, which is really being discussed seriously, is having an ASEAN Centers for Disease Control, something like a regional uh, CDC, which is very critical given that the COVID-19 is not the last pandemic that we are going to see. And we have been warned by the WHO that more of these pandemics are, are, are coming, especially in a fast changing uh, physical environment. Uh, with regard to nuclear security, there are regional mechanisms like the ASEAN ATOM, similar to the EUROTOM, that looks at enhancing and deepening cooperation with regard to ensuring nuclear security, safety, and also um, non and safeguards. So these are areas where you can see uh, regional institutions doing work at the regional level uh, if there is, and at the same time, filling in the gaps that global institutions may not be able to provide. And third and final point is that realization that global governance is, you know, when you talk about not just governments, but governance is a set of processes uh, and institutions and norms as the international community constantly have to deal with a rapid changing environment. So, uh, so with this uh, in mind as a dynamic process, one can therefore do a lot to, for example, strengthen and reform our current institutions. Uh, there is, of course, a need to review the IHR as far as the W processes are concerned. Uh, there's also a need to realize uh, that the UN as a body uh, needs to be given enough resources, latitude and mandate to fulfill its increasingly demanding missions. Uh, I recall in the recent UNGA discussions that the UN is only as best as the members would allow them to do so. Second, I think, is global governance needs to be viewed as a multi-level set of processes with the aim of achieving convergence between the global, the regional, and the national uh, norms and policies. At the national level, of course, there is the need, and this is what I think Des has mentioned, about the importance of national governments in its being able to translate these norms, whether it is nuclear security, whether it's climate change or pandemics, into national legislation and practices. Therefore, global and regional governance can no longer just be a state-led process. Participation and engagement of non-state actors, international foundations and the private sector all have a role in making and improving the, the set, uh, in improving and addressing the kind of challenges that we have. I mean, the example in the pandemics uh, has been mentioned about the initiative which, which is led by the WHO in partnership with the coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is CEPI and Gavi, together with the Gates Foundation, working in reducing risk and facilitating equitable access to vaccines by all countries. In here, the role of the Gates Foundation is important. Now, in dealing with uh, advancing um, nuclear security, I think the role of, of non-state actors like the ICANNs in, in, in advancing the ban treaty 
uh, is also very important. So all actors, so global governance now has to be seen as a multi-level, multi-sectoral uh, enterprise, that which, which can come together to work on the global challenges in this century and, 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 and beyond. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Millie. I mean, in particular for emphasizing that norm or standard setting role of the United Nations, as you did at the beginning, sometimes neglected in this discussion. Uh, thanks for emphasizing, as you did at the end, the role of non-state actors, civil society generally, which also tends very much to be neglected, that potential for bottom-up contribution to better governance. And I want to explore that in the discussion session, which we conclude with. But thanks also, of course, for focusing, as you did, on the issue of regional governance and regional institutions. Uh, it is a question as to whether some of these institutions have promised more than they've delivered. Uh, you'll have some more to say, no doubt, about that in the context of ASEAN, maybe DES in the context of the EU uh, when we get to the discussion. But thanks so much for that. And let me call finally now for his presentation on my very distinguished compatriot, Kevin Rudd. Can I just add, before Kevin starts, I do apologise that the uh, the Anglo-Saxon grey hairs have all proved technologically incompetent when it comes to painting the wallpaper behind us for the Jeju Forum 2020. It's not for lack of any affection or respect for the Jeju Forum. It's purely a function of our lack of technical capacity to get the job done of painting that wallpaper in the time we had available. Our Asian friends have demonstrated clear supremacy in that respect, and I congratulate uh, Dongik and Millie on that. So over to you, Kevin, to carry us through to the discussion. Speak for yourself. Uh, speak for yourself, Anglo-Saxon grey hair. Uh, <laughs> I just pro I just protested and said I wasn't doing it. And so um, uh, anyway, it's good to be with you, and uh, good to see you, Des. <clears throat> uh, great to see you, Dong Yik, and uh, and Melly as well. Uh, and thank you to APLN for doing this, Jeju Forum, and all our friends in uh, the Republic of Korea who uh, have made a huge effort in recent years to facilitate regional and global dialogue on the future of uh, the multilateral system. So a shout out to our friends <clears throat> in the ROK. So, Gareth, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, in the time allocated is, um, first of all, briefly talk about uh, three examples from the past uh, in terms of multilateralism working um, well. Another example where it's worked over time and one where it didn't work at all uh, to try and reflect on a few lessons. Uh, second thing I'd like to do is to make two recommendations for the future. And the third is uh, a closing observation about how those of us who are policy wonks uh, can actually um, help in building a global domestic political constituency for multilateralism, uh, given that um, most of our voting publics do not understand it and are often told by half of our domestic political systems that it's evil and bad. So there are my three um, uh, sections to what I'm about to say. Firstly, examples uh, from the past. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned briefly the establishment of the uh, G20 during the global financial crisis. Now, I know it's uh, not technically a multilateral organisation because it's um, selective according to size. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in terms of its innovation and at least partial success, it's worth reflecting on. Why did it succeed in uh, uh, dealing with the global financial crisis and preventing a global financial meltdown and an entrenched recession becoming, in fact, a deep depression, which was the early prognoses we received from all of our economic advisors at the time? I think uh, it uh, was avoided because we had American leadership, albeit at that stage diminished American leadership because it was the end of the Bush administration, uh, whose uh, political credibility globally had begun to evaporate over the Iraq war. Nonetheless, uh, they had sufficient knowledge of what was at stake uh, and knowledge that the US alone could not solve this one that they innovated. 
Um, and secondly, they also reached out and had, frankly, four or five states which fashioned the agenda with them in different ways and often with different tasks, both technical, political and diplomatic. Uh, and those states, if I recall it accurately, were the Brits, um, Gordon Brown was uh, in the chair at the time, the Germans, uh, Angela was uh, even there back then, the Chinese, um, who played a significant role at the time, uh, when there was no contest in terms of the question of global leadership, uh, generally between China and the US. And then finally, um, uh, we Australians. And it's quite remarkable with a ginger group of five drawn from different hemispheres, what you could construct um, and how an agenda for the critical uh, summit of the G20, which was the London summit of March, April 2009, actually changed the world. It, if you look at all the graphs, that's when the financial collapse stopped and the economic recovery began. So that worked. Uh, secondly, on climate, my second example, um, for my sins, I was uh, one of the two founding members of what later became known as the Cartagena Group uh, of those seeking a strong, proactive, positive, ambitious outcome from the UNFCCC negotiations. And at that stage, we had all eyes focused on Copenhagen in 2009. Um, and then uh, it continued its work through to 2015. Um, so in the days before Zoom was ever thought of, uh, we had basically a group of nine or ten of us as heads of government uh, drawn from all over the world, Calderon from Mexico, myself, um, um, at the um, conference chair, then the Danish Prime Minister, the Brits, uh, Ban Ki-moon, others, and this was being worked on to hone the agenda down because we knew that our officials did not have anything like sufficient political mandate to turn what was then the impossible text on climate uh, into something which was digestible uh, uh, to produce a real outcome at Copenhagen unless we as heads of government crunched it. And at the end, we came quite close um, in bringing it about. It fell apart because of... Um, uh, I think President Obama being relatively new to the scene, to be quite honest, and uh, the climate change agenda was relatively unfamiliar to him at that stage, though he was willing. And also because uh, we had the massive reaction by the BRICS um, uh, combination of India and China, uh, who effectively um, torpedoed the process amidships. But it came very close, and it was in the balance. The virtue, however, of that Cartagena group of the policy willing uh, was that it became the engine room for the creative work uh, which led us to Paris. Um, there were other things done as well, but it became a critical international instrumentality on the way through. One of the things, for example, I did in cahoots with the Prime Minister of Denmark was use the G20 to convene a G20 meeting on the sides of the of a uh, of an APEC summit um, on purely uh, the um, uh, Copenhagen agenda. And we again, we came close. The third example, which didn't work at all, which is kind of instructive, uh, was uh, what I was asked to do in 2016, which was out of government uh, to chair this uh, independent commission on multilateralism to produce a, frankly, an omnibus uh, review of how the multilateralism's multilateral system stood at the end of Ban Ki-moon's period and what could be done to make it work. And my observations then was that we could have spent a huge amount of time recommending various elements of system design and redesign, machinery design or redesign, uh, new um, uh, multilateral mechanisms. But the pragmatist in me said the only way to make these things work uh, was to look specifically at mechanisms which were able to harness political capital to make the existing institutions, the multilateral system, work rather than waste your political capital trying to innovate with new ones. That was the thesis. And we did that precisely with the WHO. I produced an entire report on WHO reform entitled 
how to manage the next pandemic, quote unquote. This came out in 2017. Uh, obviously, it had a big readership because um, none of it was taken seriously. Um, and uh, But uh, it was quite clear, um, as were other reviews of the WHO in the period after swine flu in 2009, uh, on what needed to be done. So what I'm saying is there was no uh, group of the policy willing, uh, willing to take up that commission's recommendations on how to make the existing system work, including on the WHO. So they're my three examples, positive, half positive, and negative. I'll finish on this, Gareth. Yeah. Yeah, finish on this. For the future, and um, uh, I would say regionally and globally. Regionally, uh, well, let me do globally first and come back to regionally. Globally, as I've written elsewhere only a few months ago, we need, uh, frankly, uh, to triage the multilateral system right now, given superpower and great power impasse, um, by having a what I describe as a, a multilateral seven, a multilateral ten. Um, and what are their characteristics? One, they're not seeking to prosecute their national interests uh, in this exercise because their national interest is to make the multilateral system work across the board. And that's where their political capital is directed. Two, Middle powers who combined have sufficient diplomatic footprint globally to uh, harness constituencies to make it to make each individual element of reform work, and three where necessary to throw financial capital at it as well, and four to coordinate such an agenda through the combined planning staffs of those seven or ten countries uh, with a defined agenda but with a defined set of coordinated actions. And the, the list is a familiar one without offending people around this room, but we've made up of three or four Europeans, the, the French, the Germans, the Brits, the Brussels, possibly the Swedes, in Asia, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Indonesians, the Australians, possibly the Sings because of their work with small, small states, uh, and, then, and therefore being a bit of the exception. And I think from North America, the Canadians and the Mexicans. Um, and the Mexicans obviously having Latin American coverage. Question mark what to do about Africa. But that group, uh, I think, has a capacity to focus on four or five reforms on vaccines to deal with the big question of vaccine dissemination once it's developed, Gavi, Gavi Plus. What do we do with net zero and uh and uh, peaking for GHG emissions, given the Chinese statement, and that could be made to work, given where the Europeans are as well, in really harnessing firepower for Desert Glasgow. And on the nukes front, um, I'm attracted to using such a group to bring us to uh, what we've failed for 20 years to do, uh, which is to get the Chinese and the Americans to sign and ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty if we have a Biden administration and if there is a Chinese interest, as I think there will be, to take the temperature down with the Americans in terms of the next phase of strategic competition if the Dems are elected. I'll leave my comments there and I'll touch on regional questions in the discussion. Okay, well, thanks very much, Kevin. Um, There's a hell of a lot there in what you've said and I think it's a wonderful segue to the discussion which we'll now have and let's bounce straight off that last recommendation of yours at a global level about mobilising a group of uh, essentially middle middle players, not not the not the super big guys, uh, to provide that degree of commitment and organisation and political focus that is manifestly lacking in so many of our international institutions. So, let me straight away ask our other panelists how they react to that. It does pick up some of the themes which each of you have been articulating in your own ways about the absence of leadership the utility of the middle power role, the utility of the, the regional players' role. Um, is this going to be good enough to make a difference, to fill some of those gaps which are out there in the international governance system? And um, we can come at this differently, but our APLN colleague, Ramesh Takur, a few years ago, wrote that with international governance, both regional and global, the key to getting it right was to recognise that there's five separate gaps that have to be filled. There's a knowledge gap, making sure that people appreciate and understand the nature of the problem or problems. There's the, um, 
there's the normative gap to make sure that people have the will to address those problems and have some sense of the standards which are relevant in doing so. There's the policy gap of having mechanisms that will actually wrestle with the nuts and bolts, the levers, uh, which will effectively solve the problem in question. It's the institutional gap of having the actual mechanisms there available to, uh, to follow through and deliver. And then there's the compliance gap, which um, is obviously relevant in the context of Security Council resolutions and judicial decisions, making sure that when decisions are made, that people follow them. So there's all those gaps to be filled there. And I think that's been an underlying theme in what all of you have been saying. Will the kind of mechanism that Kevin is proposing uh, do anything to fill any of them? Or is that just another bit of wishful thinking? Des, what about you for a start? These days I'm very conscious, you know, where I'm speaking from, you know, so this is a country that is diminishing its role um, um, internationally while talking about global Britain, you know, is doing everything it can apparently to diminish it, it, its role. I mean, my, my initial response to what Kevin said is that I would be in favour and would support that sort of initiative. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, looking at this from a European perspective, we spent the last... I don't know, 10 years in the NATO context and the OSCE context being pulled by our American cousins in the R, you know, from the people that live in my island, they are our cousins, um, encouraging us to take more responsibility for our own security. I'm very much in favour of that because should Europe collectively take responsibility for its own security, it would be a different security. It would be a more uh, uh, collective security. It would be you know, more of a security of mutuality of interest. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 you know, I encourage that. And I think that the EU would be a very strong partner in the sort of, um, in, 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 in the sort of, of, of uh, engagement that Kevin has suggested and, and would be influential. I just doubt whether um, the governance, the government of, of my country would tend to look west rather than east um, for it, it, its leadership in that regard. But I think there is there is a lot to be said for that. I mean, I have to say honestly that I have less experience of global or, or even to some degree regional governance than I have of national governance. And I know where the gaps are in this, um, in, in, from, from a British perspective, where the gaps are in, in this existential risk environment. You know, and maybe... You know, as the as the conversation goes on, we can talk about this knowledge gap and how it influences policy. You know, I'm afraid it will be specific national examples I will give you, but they are consistent. And in my experience, you know, they can only be overcome by a dialogue of the sort that Kevin talks about, in which we share knowledge and in which we we you know we bring collective influence to bear. The sort of coalition that he talks about would find it had a lot in common about the world it wanted to live in. Well, Dongek Shin, um, what do you think are the most crucial of the gaps that need to be filled at the global level? And to what extent do you think that this kind of multilateral rescue mission that uh, Kevin articulates with a, a group of self-selected uh, players, not the super big guys, but the, the kind of middle powers that you were talking about before, what difference do you think uh, that sort of enterprise could make in filling those gaps? Dongek? Uh I know the Kevin uh, and you, Australia, has played an important role in uh, establishing, developing the G20 mechanism. The G20 uh, composed composition is both the advanced and emerging economies. So, in that sense, this comprehensive mechanism can handle together and the global challenge issue. But at the same time, uh, the coalition and like my country's group can be uh, another force to uh, move ahead, move on, that the global, uh, the common efforts to address many issues. So in our case, uh, the regional uh, initiative together with ASEAN, ASEAN is in the middle, the centrality uh, in the region. So that is more neutral and uh, kind of impartial position between the big powers, between China and United States. So we like to be uh, the, in the group as middle powers. So the, in, from the different region, middle power initiative, that's quite important. 
So in the United Nations also we have the certain rule. And Australia, for example, the Korea, Mexico, Indonesia, and Turkey is called all different reasons, different culture and religious background can be opposed to face the daily, uh, the uh, three main important issues, the climate change and pandemic and nuclear non-preparation. So we can collect, mobilize the quite different uh, forces uh, for other reasons. And to narrow the gap, fill the gap between developed and developing, developed and developing countries, I think we can do something. And for example, the I touched the ODA development assistance. So the now until now, the most uh, the cases of the pandemic COVID-19 is now occurring in more advanced the cold weather countries. But we don't know yet about the other reason, Africa and Middle East, South America, South America is quite now outstanding. So the, we can share our knowledge and also our some uh, the economic and financial assistance through the ODA, Official Development Assistance, and technology, capacity building. That is one area. So the South Korea is specializing in, uh, in helping other countries. And the, the institutional the area, so we have the United Nations at the same time. So some uh, the regional base for the Vaccine Institute located in Seoul and also the GGGI, Global Green Growth uh, Institute, and the fight the climate change to help the developing countries global climate fund. Also, that is the regional or the international uh, governing uh, the base uh, it is now part of in our the activities of South Korean government. Okay. But, so, Millie, Millie, from your perspective, tackling it at the global the global level rather than the regional just for the moment what do you think are the most crucial or alarming gaps in the international global governance system and to what extent do you think that the kind of enterprise that uh, kevin is talking about mobilizing a core group of really committed multilateral players albeit self-selected what difference do you think that could make to filling what you regard as the most important gap problems among the list of, of five uh, variables that you have mentioned, Gareth, my, my, my answer would be all of the above, really, because uh, given the kind of problems that we face, I mean, look at climate change. It's been, it's been described in many ways, complex, uh, wicked problem, etc. And our current institutions, really, I, I talked about, you know, the, the debates in the UNSC when it, do we actually, does the UN actually need a special body that just is dedicated to climate change? I mean, is, is it institutional, but without a mandate, uh, with, without an agreement? Uh, you know, in terms of policy, convergence in policy, and without enough sufficient knowledge uh, being put, the kind of people that you bring in, uh, we talk about the, the gap between the scientists and the policy makers, the need for translation of that. Uh, you know, you really, you really need to fill in all of those, identify where the gaps are. But if you need a special body, like the way uh, Gavin has, has mentioned this, well, it's always good to have, you know, look at the coalition of the willing, look in this part of the world, we've talked about the quad, right? Because existing uh, security arrangements are deemed to be inadequate. But if you had a group of four, which excludes one, then you have a problem of exclusion and, and some kind of isolation. So there's always that perception. So um, I, I guess from the perspective of the region, you know, this whole thing about variable geometry, no matter how messy it is in terms of institutions, are useful. And within the re uh, and and I mean, why do you need I understand the, the, the strength, the need to triage perhaps, but the G20 itself, when it comes to dealing with the global financial crisis in 2008 and dealing with these pandemics, you know, uh, as, is, is, is still as not as, you know, as, as perhaps as efficient as we would need be. During the global financials of 1997, what has happened is it's really the, the smaller countries that came together. So you had the ASEAN Plus 3 Chiang Mai initiative that dealt with the financial crises. Uh, in dealing with uh, the pandemics at the regional level, so you have the ASEAN Plus 3. So um, while you have this global bodies, right, in dealing with particular issues, global bodies like the UN and the G20, I believe is sufficient. Uh, and, 
Because the more you create institutions, this especially if you exclude other regions like Latin America or Africa that faces this major crisis, you can have agreements on climate change. But if Latin America, the African countries are not fully represented, and if China is not also there because you know they, they can be excluded, then there is a problem when it comes to pushing ahead. You can have ideas and agreements, but implementation is becomes a major issue. Okay. Well, Kevin, that throws really the challenge back to you. You said yourself in handling that um, international commission that the taste for new institutions was probably misconceived and it was far better to focus on getting the existing ones working properly. In that context, we do have a prima facie credible policy-making institution with global reach, and that's the G20, as you yourself spelled out, was very successful in responding to the GFC. What What is it that um, leads you to think the G20 can't be the crucial global energizer, that it can't get its mojo back together again? Is it because it's got the big guys there and they're just irredeemably now locked into strategic rivalry and unable to respond effectively to the multilateral cooperation challenge? But is, isn't the G20 at the global level, and perhaps the EAS will come to the regional in a moment, uh, the best vehicle at the local level without trying to invent something new, particularly if there's obvious questions about uh, representational legitimacy, as Millie just pointed out? So, you, what's wrong with the G20? Well, remember, hmm? Sure. I was uh, around when we had all these discussions in the first place in the creation of G20. Um, where I disagree with Melly, and just to be blunt about it, um, as you know, Melly, we Australians are always blunt. Um, it's that, um, but friendly blunt, not unfriendly blunt, uh, yeah. is that this is not about creating a new institution. Uh, the quad is not what we're talking about. The quad's for a geopolitical purpose to uh, roll back against China. It's got nothing to do with um, a group of states uh, with um, reasonable levels of, shall we say, diplomatic clout, whose combined purpose is this, to make the existing multilateral system work, the multilateral system which includes everybody. But what we do know is that institutions within the system, as the WTO, the UNFCCC, and the rest, including in the arms control and disarmament field, don't work unless you have, let me call it, a ginger group of uh, leading states capable of forging a policy proposal and then diplomatising it through the rest of the system. So that's my generic thesis. Going to Gareth's specific point about the G20, that's why I've always been a supporter of the, supporter of the G20, for the simple reason is it represents 90% of the global economy, it represents um, a huge tranche uh, of global trade, it represents a huge tranche of uh, foreign direct investment and a huge tranche, practically all of global ODA. Now, um, when MICTA was created, and uh, Dong Yik referred to it before, um, blame me, this was uh, my baby um, when I was foreign minister actually of Australia. I then called it, uh, uh, Dong Yik, the M7. And the whole point of it was, looking at the structure of the G20, I could already see it polarising between, uh, as it were, the old G7 types and the emerging BRICS types. Um, and that was very clear to me uh, at Copenhagen, where you had India, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, China, South Africa, um, and the G7, as it were, sparring badly. So my argument to colleagues at the time was, we need to make this G20 work for the future and through it make the multilateral system work for the future. So we convened our first um, MICTA, except I called it then uh, uh, G, uh, the M7 group, the multilateral seven group or middle power seven group. Uh, it lost Cabos, I think, in 2011. Final point, Gareth, on making it work, therefore, is that, so that was one experiment. The other experiment you see at the moment is being put together for the same objective, uh, but with different instrumentalities between the French and the Germans and their new alliance on multilateralism. I've been to all the formative meetings on that in New York over the last six to 12 months. So here's the synthesis as I would see it. This group, by and large, that I'm calling now the expanded MICTA, 
the expanded M7, are practically all G20 countries. But they are seeking to make the multilateral system, they could be making the, through this level of collaboration, making the multilateral system, both G20, the UN, and the Bretton Woods institutions work effectively. Uh, and that is their collective mission statement, as opposed to, as it were, resolving the high geopolitics of the US versus China on everything. So that's where my logic goes. Okay, we've got not much time to cover quite a lot more ground. I do want to address the UN and the Security Council in particular, and in that context, make the point that um, the kind of ginger group that Kevin is talking about sometimes just does run out of ginger when it comes to actually getting change at the high institutional level where the big guys have entrenched power and authority as they do with the exercise of the veto and the membership itself of the, the permanent group in the P5. So, Des, um, wearing your hat as a P5 member now rather than as a good bottom-up civil society agitator, what is to be done about getting the UN Security Council representing the world of the 21st century rather than the middle of the last century? And what is to be done about somehow re removing or modifying that veto power, which they have to agree to modify if it's to happen, when that is so often being exercised at the expense of effective governance, at least in the peace and security area, Des? Okay, so... I mean, I was a member of a government and I, I think I've been governed in the last 20 years by um, governments to support reform of, of, uh, of the Security Council. But there is there's no consensus for this. You know, I mean, I, I occasionally find myself in a multilateral environment talking about how much I like multilateralism, but how, how much I hate consensus, you know, because it just, it just you know, it's, it's the stumbling block for you know, for any what I consider to be progressive change so often. Um, I mean, I, I just, I just, I, it's interesting, you know, the remark to the conversation I wasn't in about the G20, but, you know, the G20 grew out of the financial crisis. And, and you would have thought that the COVID-19 pandemic, which wasn't just a health crisis, but has been a significant economic crisis, arguably a crisis, you know, that's affected every aspect of our life that we value. Um, would have reached to the G20. So what you have is you have a US leadership that, you know, that sort of set it as them against us. Um, you had you had arguably Chinese uh, incapable of, of leading that. And the chairmanship was in the hands of Saudi Arabia, who just don't have the leadership capacity to convene it. You know, so the you know, finance ministers of the G20 met and have done some good work, but the G20 should have stepped up to the mark. Um, as, as they did in the financial crisis and didn't and failed. And, and you know, I mean, I, I don't sit in U United Nations and never have, and I don't know the internal workings of this, but as an observer, you know, there just is not the willingness or the capacity of the people who control the vetoes at the moment to reform the United Nations, which is what argues for what Kevin's talking about. You know, those of us who think alike need to go and see the degree to which we can build uh, our capacity to be able to, to to make change here. And I just, and you know, bearing in mind the very short time that we have here, one of the real fundamental problems about what we are doing with here, what, what we're dealing with here is that it depends on a knowledge of science that honestly our leaders do not have. You know, the scientific community, I mean, I'm living in Cambridge here, surrounded by some of the best scientists in the world. Um, not exclusively, but some of them. And it's a very international place spend a lot of time talking to them, but they speak a different language even from me, and I'm steeped in, in conversations with them. And certainly I know that people in the public policy environment speak a different language too. We need to get these two scientists, engineers, and, and people in the public policy environment to live together so that they understand each other and understand the nature of these existential risks and what we could, uh, how we can deal with them. And that's the, the step that I would most want to see, is somehow a closer integration of the people who understand these risks, they understand how they develop, they understand how we contribute to them, and those who make the policy decisions. And I think we will get different policy when you get there, uh, when you get to that point. I'll give people in closing... I'll give people in closing an opportunity to respond to any of these things, but let me just raise one more topic at least 
uh, for general discussion, and that is the role of regional governance as effective contributors to solving some of these governance problems. Uh, perhaps, Dongik, starting with you, is the absence of a Northeast Asian regional governance system anything remotely resembling ASEAN, let alone Europe? Is this, is this a problem or is it something that uh, really has little relevance to the effective resolution of these existential and other problems that we're talking about? How big a gap is it that there's an absence of any kind of serious regional dialogue or sub-regional dialogue in Northeast Asia? Okay, um, so firstly, the regional and global governance system, I fully agree, Kevin and the dad about the UN Security Council, the Big Five, and also even G20, we face the same problem. The last days, the United States, now is a stumbling block. So the, I think the countering the, the Big Five, or well, the big guys, so our MPI, the big middle powers, we can collect our force countering sometimes and balancing two sides. So coming back to your questions regarding the, our the regional cooperation in Northeast Asia. The final, uh, we try to, to establish that mechanism for a long time, more than 20, 20 years. But uh, the last days, that the problem always go to the North Korea. North Korea, until they will come out with uh, some solution on the democratization, it will be very hard. So we, every government, South Korean government, under the different president, initiate different name, North East Asian Cooperation Dialogue or Cooperation um, the Initiative, the platform, but regardless of the, the difference of name, the substance is same. So that's why we like to go beyond the Korean Peninsula, beyond the North East Asia, connecting with the South East Asia and other reason. So that's the multilateral and why we need more. So in certain states, we strongly believe North Korea will join. But I think it's China and Russia is always in, with, together with the North Korean side. But uh, we, we try to help North Korea come out to habit of dialogue, discussion with other reasons. But that's our long-term goal. And eventually, we materialize that dream with the denuclearization, nuclear program of North Korea is a fundamental of the obstacles to resolve first. So President Moon is now very hard in pushing North Korea come back to dialogue table. Well, we could spend a whole session on North Korea and of course the Jeju Forum will, but Meli, coming to you on the regional governance issue, is the role and significance of ASEAN a little bit, teensy bit overstated in terms of the capacity to actually deliver results? I'm thinking in particular in the peace and security area where there's a manifest ASEAN interest or Southeast Asian interest in uh, pushing back against what China's up to in the South China Sea, but it's been absolutely impossible to get any kind of consensus position out of ASEAN because of China's obvious influence over a couple of your members, at least Cambodia, Laos, and increasing influence over others, Thailand, uh, Philippines, maybe Myanmar. Isn't it all a little bit of a bust, uh, the hope that there can be some effective regional cooperation, coherence, united front uh, to resist these sorts of tensions that are manifestly developing. You must be familiar with these arguments. You're in the middle of them for many years at ASEAN and still are. But uh, what's, well, what's the case for the defence about ASEAN as contribution to regional governance? Well, if you look at security as not just the South China Sea, then you can see that ASEAN has worked in many ways. Um, looking at the kind of security challenges that we now face, whether it's pandemic, climate change, food security, etc., the kind of cooperation that uh, that's taking place, I mean, concrete cooperation that's taking place is to, has gone a long way in improving and at least mitigating many of the challenges uh, of, of whether it's climate change or pandemics. I mean, I've, I've mentioned about the, the co current cooperation that's being done, right? And this is a major security issue. 
Uh, for South China Sea, sure, there is a realization that, uh, you know, since 2012, the kind of singular uh, common uh, statement uh, is, is now getting increasingly tenuous with a kind of influence by China. But China is doing its, uh, how do you say, it? it's doing itself in, so to speak, that expression, because particularly in light of, you know, under the cover of the pandemic, China's aggressive, uh, you know, aggressiveness in the South China Sea has become intolerable for many countries in the region, and those that have been quiet and the set sitting in the fence are now starting to find their voice. So increasingly for the, over the last two years and, and, and in, in this current year, in spite of the fact that all these regional meetings are being held online, there's a push for, uh, you know, for calling out China uh, and having a common position. And if uh, there's now countries who've been more reticent before, like Vietnam, uh, like Malaysia to some extent, um, even Cambodia, because there's also this. You have to. You have to also to remember that, uh, in spite of the so-called uh, la guess that China has given to many parts of the region, it's you know it's in the face presence in parts of Cambodia. It's really getting a lot of uh, is is generating this quite among its population. So in the recent study, I mean this is the, uh, 2019 in December, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies here in Singapore actually conducted a survey. And uh, it, it's interestingly, the survey said among the dialogue partners in ASEAN, China is the least trusted. So the growing trust deficit that's happening in the region with China's aggressiveness in the South China Sea in the last few months, particularly in April, is not is coming down, uh, you know, is coming down hard on Southeast Asia. So, but in okay. resolving the crisis, I don't think you can do that, but in managing it, surely that is something that is being addressed. But the point that I want to raise is it's not, it's never promising to resolve the security problems in the region. It's trying to work uh, together to address many of these challenges. So um, yeah. I, I think sometimes ASEAN is misunderstood because they have all these big things about its centrality, etc. But I think it's very modest in its aim as to how it actually aims to manage uh, the kind of, of challenges in different, well, uh, uh, different characterization. Uh, well, in the, yeah. Some of us think it conceals that modesty pretty well on some occasions, but um, I'm sure you're right about the potential significance of ASEAN. And we just keep our fingers crossed that it can play that role. We all hope for it. Kevin, you wanted to say we're back to our last five minutes now, so we all have to be very quick in the run home. But Kevin, you did want to make a point or two about regional governance. And you also want to make a point about the role of policy wonks, I think, in uh, dealing with these governance issues. So perhaps you could conclude by putting that on the record. Yeah, just a couple of concluding thoughts, Gareth. Um, one, by the way, I defend ASEAN for its in intra-ASEAN role. Um, mm. We all know the history, and frankly, I still give them 9 out of 10 for turning warring states into peaceful states internally. Um, your comment about ASEAN is their external pan-regional role. You tried to fill that gap, uh, my friend, when you innovated with the ASEAN Regional Forum back in the Mesolithic period, um, um, I sought to follow that in the Neolithic period uh, when um, I, um, with your help actually, uh, tried to uh, get the um, uh, East Asian uh, Summit to live up to the potential articulated in the Kuala Lumpur Declaration of 2005, which for the first time brought together effectively the ASEAN uh, grouping uh, plus six um, uh, with a, um, a uh, peace and security mandate. Um, so we tried. We managed to get the ASEANs to agree to bring the Russians and the Americans in. Um, but the idea of building what I described then as a Asia-Pacific community, which was to do soft and then eventually hard security questions on a pan-regional basis with the Chinese and the Americans and the ASEANs around the table, uh, so far has been stillborn. We've done a paper on this at my Policy Institute, uh, if anyone is interested in terms of East Asian peace architecture, peace and security architecture. And finally, on building political constituencies, the problem for us wonks is that um, we are essentially rationally driven um, and, uh, and most of our voting publics are not. Um, and so, in fact, most of our voting publics have been told by uh, centre-right and right-wing politicians for the last decade that multilateralism is evil. Um, and uh, if not evil, then at least bad. 
Um, and you've seen the upworkings of that um, in Des's country, uh, in uh, Brexit and the rest. So therefore, what do we do about it? Um, the idea that I have is a pretty simple one, and it goes back to this group of uh, the M7 or the M10, pooling funds to run a global advertising campaign about what the multilateral system does in positive terms, which voting people can understand. Take just polio as the example. Take the other three practical examples about where our global collaboration has taken us in the last 75 years. There's a great story to be told, but the point is not just to make us feel virtuous, it's to start to build a constituency of support around the world um, and to counter the narrative of, let's call it, right-wing populism. There you go. Thanks for that. We're right up against the clock, but just one minute each for our other three panellists for any concluding thought you have about how to move forward and resolve some of the obvious problems we have at the moment with the quality of global regional governance. Starting again with you, Des. I mean, we have a disintegrate. We have the best example of regional governance, I think, in the whole of the world in the European Union and, you know, the combination of NATO and the European Union. But we're beginning to, it's beginning to disintegrate because of a, an attack by nationalism from the inside of the European Union. And I'm ashamed of my country's contribution to this, I have to say. We should, you know, we should remind people and we should remind people in this part of the world exactly what the EU brought. You know, I mean, I just uh, was reflecting just the other day as it was celebrating its 70th anniversary that it, that it rightfully won the Nobel Peace Prize you know, I think about 2012 or 2011, for the years of peace that we had had in, in, in Europe, and that's its greatest achievement. So, yeah. But, you know, we live in a world in which everything that is positive is described as fake news, you know, and everything that threatens is described as being, you know, the legitimate. But, but, but my sense is, and I repeat this, I don't give up on coming generations. I mean, they're living in a different world than we are, I think, I fear because of our ages and their, you know, a world without borders um, in which they have conversations across the world. And these younger people, I have a lot, of, a lot of hope for them. I think we should reach out to them and mobilise. They're mobilising themselves in some part of the world over these existential risks. Great. Kongi, concluding thought? So to reinvigorate, to re-energise the multilateralism, global governance system, the connection, still connection is very important. Uh, among the countries uh, in the region, same region as well as different region, to revitalize the uh, ASEAN together with Northeast Asian countries and and among the Asia Pacific countries between Asia and Europe. So we have very close contact with the European counterparts and also the G20 again. So that's uh, the reason that through why we need to further develop the G20 to covering uh, most of issues, including but the digital technology, so it will make now easier for connection. So freely we can exchange our thought and our the common uh, views. So the in COVID-19 the time period, we can further develop the, through the, the digital technology of the regional cooperation or inter-regional cooperation. That's how we can make uh, the alliance and coalition much stronger So to prevent the recurrence and unilateral, the nationalism going along, the very dangerous, uh, the world society will not be uh, the last long. Okay. Thanks, Tongik. And Millie, and in throwing to you, might I say that I wholly endorse what Kevin said about the role of ASEAN as a conflict prevention mechanism. Like the EU, I think it's been one of the two great global examples of conflict prevention institutional conflict prevention over the last half century and much to be admired in that respect. So I did want to make that point before you finish up. Where you go. Melly. Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, as far as institutions, G20, UN, ASEAN, uh, EU, I think, uh, and the, Kevin's proposal about, you know, um, modified uh, whatever, G, middle power thing. I think institutions are important, but something is missing in our conversation. And that is that while we create institutions, think about how we make them more effective, there's, else, there's actually a growing mistrust and distrust of institutions. With increasing the digitalization, that is actually making it more acute. I mean, with fake news, et cetera, and with digitalization uh, comes all the other threats. 
And so, so that is something that, you know, that I think is, is not discussed in, in the whole conversation of global governance. And this is where I go back to my main point, my, um, the last point that governance, global governance is not just governments alone nowadays. I mean, it has to be, it has to now be multi-level and multi-actor. I mean, we talked about the new governance in the European, I mean, union where it's, it's more, uh, you know, it's more flat, heretical, there are different sides of authority. Why? Because increasingly you need the community's engagement in it. Whether we deal with fake news, whether we deal with pandemics, whether we deal with the mitigate, mitigating the impact of climate change. And once you have the buy-in of the community that is, you know, that has been fragmented all this while because of, you know, the different uh, and equal benefits of globalization, then it makes for, uh, you know, for them to trust these institutions. Because unless you, you are able to regain that trust, then you can have all the institutions there, but <laughs> it's quite hard to move things forward now in, in an increasingly interconnected world, but actually fragmented as a result of an equal uh, inequality. I thought I'd put that there as a last thought. Well, impossible to summarize in a sentence or two such a rich conversation, but I think merely put a finger on it right at the end by indicating the multidimensional nature of the task of restoring confidence and credibility in the multilateral cooperation, the global system, the regional system of that cooperation. It's got to come top down, obviously, without the big guys, without the United States, without the China recommitting themselves or committing themselves to serious, serious responsible behaviour of a multilateral kind. Uh, nothing much is really going to happen on a lot of these really crucial issues, above all arms control. But it also requires middle-level pressure, and that's been a, a theme right through our discussion, very well articulated by all of you. And uh, we really do need to build on strategies and practices and processes that will give weight and credibility to those middle powers who, between us, have such a, a real dependence on clearly a rules-based international order, as we constantly say. But it also depends on the third dimension, the bottom-up dimension, the pressure from communities, the engagement of communities, the recognition by non-state actors, by civil society, that multilateral cooperation matters and that it really is crucial uh, if we are to solve these big existential threats and many of the other global and regional public goods problems we've touched upon to have that commitment from governments. And governments are responsive to bottom-up pressure, even in authoritarian systems. And we have to devote a lot of resources to mobilizing that. So thank you all. Thanks to Jeju Forum for allowing us to run this session. Thanks to the APLM, Asia Pacific Leadership Network, for the organizational effort that went into putting this panel together. And thanks above all to our fantastically distinguished uh, panelists, Kevin Rudd, Meli Caballero Anderson, Dong Ixing and Des Moore. Thank you so much, and that concludes this session. Thank you.